Okay, so I had thought we were finished with copyright, but actually there really is just one more thing we need to do. And after that, then I thought there was another maybe one or two more things, but I think we'll have to draw a line under the copyright today, irrespective of um, how much we get done. Okay? So what we're going to look at today is the idea of communication to the public. So one of the things a copyright holder is allowed to do is allowed to decide who is entitled to communicate their work to the public. This came up as a result of the Napster puzzle. So Napster and peer-to-peer -peer services like it never did any copying themselves nor did they ever have in their possession any of the files that were being copied. They merely put people in touch with each other who wanted to swap. So, you know, ja John and Paul were swapping files. Okay, Napster introduced them to each other, but it didn't actually do any of the copying. It never had sight of the files that were copied, typically in Napster's case, music. And it, the files didn't even travel on Napster's network or anything like that. You know, these two people just did a swap themselves. So it's if two people walk into a pub and they swap files, I mean, the barman has nothing to do with it. This is the argument Napster was making. And so this, this idea posed a, a challenge, really, to copyright as, as we understood it, because it prohibited the copying. But if you didn't copy, well, how could you be infringing copyright? And so um, we developed the idea of a, this idea of communicating something to the public. This connects up, then, with publishing models people have the business models for publishing. So lots of online content providers and newspapers in particular <coughs> make their money from advertising. So you go to the Irish Times and there's a big ad up the top and typically the Irish Times wouldn't make money unless you click on the ad. So you click on the ad and then the Irish Times will get a tiny amount of money. In some scenarios, maybe this big, huge ad or maybe something that big, you get to charge just for the fact that people see it. They don't even have to click on it. So like traditional newspapers, the advertising is a big deal. And newspapers in particular get lots of visitors directly to their website. So I go to the Irish Times and look up the news and if there's something I'm interested in, I might click on it, or I might not. The headlines might be enough for me. But we have these news aggregators that link to stories directly from their service. And this, this poses a problem, and this, this kind of wrecks the business model for newspapers. So you know on an iPhone, if you swipe left, you get sort of the news, and there might be three or four stories, and then you can go straight to that story and similarly, you can go to something like uh, Google News, news.google.com or .ie, and it'll give you a list of the headlines. And so there's these lots of, lots of sites like this. In terms of entertainment news, there are a few sites, some of, the, some of the biggest sites in the world are sites that do just that and nothing more. So the latest celebrity news, you go to the website, you see all the latest news for the celebs, then you can click on it and it'll be taken to a particular news story from a particular source. Okay, And the problem is that those people interfere with the business model a bit because if you can go directly to a story on the Irish Times that you're interested in, well, you might not see this big, huge ad on the front door. Like if you could go to even to a regular newspaper, if you could bypass everything and only see the page you were interested in, you'd miss out on a lot of advertising. And the same is true online. So it disrupts the business model for newspapers a bit. So Google News, for example, will have 
links to stories on news sites. So my, if you can go to Google News, you might see the top 10 stories. Or you might have told Google particularly what you're interested in. You're particularly interested in sport. And you might see the, the sports stuff first, whatever. Okay? So many people in the newspaper business feel like this direct linking to their content is costing them money. And the problem is that it's not at all clear how copyright law can help them. Some feel that, well, if you're linking to my stories, then you should be giving money. And then other people would be like, but yeah, it's just a link to your story. They're not copying anything. I mean, obviously, if I took stuff from the Irish Times and put it on my blog, and people came to my blog and saw my ads instead, and I got money from it, that's, you know, obvious copyright infringement. That's a no-brainer. But if I just link to a story on the Irish Times, that's... That's a trickier one, okay? So a case just like this came up in 1997, which if you think about it in internet terms is very early, a very long time ago now. And the Shetland Times published uh, news stories on the web. So it was a newspaper that had a website. And um, this Shetland News website was a portal but it provided links directly to the Shetland Times stories. So instead of going to shetlandtimes.co.uk, I guess, and seeing the news and clicking on the stories, you could go to shetlandnews.co.uk, see the headlines, and click on any story you wanted, and be taken to the Shetland Times website. So there was no copying whatsoever. It's hard to imagine that one of the most significant cases about this is to do with some pokey island um, off Scotland. So the Shetland Times sued and was granted an interdict, which is Scottish law for an injunction. So the Shetland Times was able to stop the Shetland News from doing this. And we never actually got an answer from the courts because they settled. So they came to an agreement and the case was dropped. And if you go to what is now the successor to the Shetland News, you'll even see a little sign, you know, these stories are listed here in agreement with the Shetland Times. They're still doing the same thing, but they've come to some sort of a deal. And this poses the really bizarre question, does providing a link to a work online constitute infringement? Now, the computer person in me, because I'm a computer scientist primar primar blah, primarily, is like, you know, hell no, of course not. How can a link to something constitute a, a copyright infringement? There's no copying, there's no, you know, it, it can't possibly be. But of course, I can see how something like Napster is connected with infringement in some way. And so, how, where, do you draw the, where do you draw the line? Okay. Now, if you look at the um, WIPO Copyright Treaty, there's a bit here about um, authors, and, authors of literary and artistic work shall enjoy exclusive right in authorizing any communication of the public of their works by wire or wireless means, including making available to the public of their works in such a way that members of the public may access these from a place and time individually chosen by them. This access these was to do with streaming services. If you are streaming a movie online, let's say from a website that you know is not authorized really to be doing that. Streaming isn't really copying either. You could argue, well, there's no copyright infringement because there's no copy. At any one time, the person doing the streaming, watching the show, or watching the movie, okay, they might have like 10 seconds of the movie in their buffer at any one time. But they could argue they don't actually have a copy. So there's no copyright infringement. 
And so this um, stuff about to access these works, that was put in there just to, to capture streaming services in that. So if you can access the work without copying it, that's something that the author has a right to prohibit without permission. And then there's this communication to the public. So we decided through our legislators that an author has an exclusive right to authorize any communication to the public of their works. And that seemed to make sense. But then it got caught up with things like um, television and hyperlinks. So we, want, we wanted to capture the Napster type scenario, but it's possible that we caught too many things in the net. So in this um, EU directive here, again, we're talking about communication to the public. So the question then came up is, providing a link on a web page, is that a communication to the public? Again, for me, I, I, I don't understand why it was ever an issue. It's like, of course not. How can it possibly be a communication to the public? But um, other people definitely thought this was a, a question. It's worth thinking now about what happens when you're viewing a web page. So the user will click on a link, or perhaps type in a URL, but in this case we're interested in clicking on a link. And then the network will route that request for the HTML file to the web server somewhere. So if I click on a link on Google News, it'll take me, it, the link is to a story on the Irish Times website. My browser sends off a request to the Irish Times web server for a story on whatever. CIT has a great new course or something. Okay? The web server will locate that file and send it back to my browser. Now you notice in both of these situations, the communication is between my browser here and the web server, and the web server back to my browser. Now it turns out images are quite interesting because images do not get embedded directly in HTML files. Have any done like a web page writing class? Need on that. You, it's not like, say, a Word document where you can embed an image in a Word document and then when you copy the Word document, the image comes with. In the HTML file, all you have is a link to an image. So if there are any images in the web page, they'll be coded as links. And the browser will have to go off and request the images from the web server and the images will come back and then the browser will lay out the page according to the specifications in the HTML. But what's important is that in all of those instances, the communication is between my browser and the web server and back. And the person that gave me the link has no part in that, in that transaction. Okay, so that, that technical detail is important. So once the user clicks or enters a URL, the communication is between the user's browser and the web server and there's no, um, there's no one else involved in that. The provider of the link has no further role. Which again is kind of also the same or true of Napster. Napster says, this person here has this song he's prepared to share to you. Off you go lads, do whatever you like, it's nothing to do with me. So that's the problem. Now, there are different kinds of links actually, and I think it's important to analyze this problem based on the, the category of links, okay? So I could have a news aggregator, or I could just even provide just the link. So I could say, look, here's an interesting story about whatever. And that could provide a link directly to the Irish Times website. So that's a link in its simplest form. Do you think a link like that would constitute a copyright infringement. So the Irish Times we'll accept is a literary work. The Irish Times is authorized to say, you know, who can communicate that to the public. If I say, here's an interesting story and I provide a hyperlink that if you click and it takes you there, um, 
Anybody have a problem with that? I mean, it's hard to see how you could have a problem with that. If we did have a problem with that, if that constituted copyright infringement, well, that's grand. We could just have to shut down the internet and roll back the whole thing. So certainly as a society, that's not something we're prepared to do. We're not prepared to undo the whole internet and insist, for example, that the only way to read a story on the Irish Times website is to go through the front door. Now, actually, there are technical solutions. The Irish Times could, if it really, really wanted to, insist on that. But the way the internet works at the moment, um, you can just link directly to something, and you take someone there. So certainly a simple link, it's hard to see how that could be a copyright infringement. What then about a link with like a snippet? So let's say I provide on my Ireland Times website a link to the Irish Times web story on the Irish Times website, and I copy the headline word for word. Is that okay? Do you think it's okay? Should it be okay? Well, if you're taking stuff word for word, you're infringing, aren't you? Well, it's, it's a tougher one. I mean, is a headline that short worthy of protection. It's part of a greater article that some guy's taking the trouble to... Well, I've only copied the headline, though. I mean... And somebody's created it as part of a greater article in order to mm -hmm. catch your eye. But it is a small part. I mean, it is a small part of the, the, doc, the, the article. Certainly, if you have a link to somewhere, it's reasonable to explain to the user what they might get if they click on the link. Now, should, if I'm putting a link from my Ireland Times website to the Irish Times website, I mean, should I take government pledges, fast broadband for all by end of decade, and should I, should I kind of rewrite that in my own words and maybe change the headline? Um, that's, that's arguable. Certainly, copying and pasting a headline, short and all as it is, could, could, you could stretch to that being an infringement. But it is a tiny, tiny portion. And also, like, you know, government pledges fast broadband for all by end of the decade. I mean, how many ways can you even rephrase that? You know? Or, you know, Arsenal wins 3-0. I mean, how, how many ways are you going to say it? So that's a tougher one. What about if we added a bit more text? What if we took, like, the headline in the first paragraph? Starting to get iffier, isn't it? If you're taking a little snippet of the story, you could also... I mean, even with this, you could argue that, well, just seeing that much now, I don't need to go click on the Irish Times website, actually. I know the government is going to, you know, I know the content of that story pretty much. I'm not interested in the details. So even from that much there, maybe the Irish Times has lost out on my eyeballs seeing the ads. You know? And this is certainly a bit iffier, where we include the snippet from the story. Now... I don't want to get too, too technical, <coughs> but it's possible to put in a web page a window or a frame and have the content of that frame be a different web page. So you can make a web page that has like a window in it, which inside in that is another entirely different web page. And that's called embedded content, or it could be a, a, well, a frame is the technical term. And interesting there is that in this scenario, the communication is still only between the user's browser 
and the web server. So basically, this Ireland Chimes web page has a layout. There's a box in it, and as part of the code for that, it says, no, the content for this box is available at Irish Times slash today slash whatever slash blah 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 dot HTML. So the user's browser goes away, takes that content from the Irish Times website, and embeds it in the page from Ireland Chimes. And that's technically very easy to do. The question is, would it constitute an infringement? What do you think? So, so, I mean, you're literally stealing the, the bandwidth, the text. Yeah, but you're not, you're not copying anything. Ever. You're just providing a link. Yeah, but the person reading might not know what... Uh, oh, not only the person reading might not know. I mean, that's part of it. This whole part of the whole point is, like here, it, it might not be obvious at all that it's coming from somewhere else. They're just looking, they just go to Ireland Chimes and up comes all this stuff and that's all very interesting. And some of it has come from the Ireland Chimes web server, but the business end of it has come from the Irish Times web server and it's all appearing on the one browser window. Yeah, you constructed it to look like it's your content. Exactly, exactly. Else's. And it's somebody else's entirely. But you've never copied it. That's the next best thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's as, as far as you can go without copying. The question is, is providing a link to content online infringing? I would say so. But I mean, what's the difference between this and this? Where do you draw the line? How do you draw the line? It's a bit tricky. I mean, I think this is certainly taking the piss. But legally where, how, how how do you do that how do you how do you draw the line and that's what's that's what's tricky images are particularly troublesome that's why i a minute ago went to the trouble of explaining to you that images don't come with the page because i could for example include in my web page an image from your website just by providing the link to the image on your web server. And so my web page now has your image, but I can do that without ever copying the image. I just send the web browser off to get your image whenever I need it. And that's a problem because we have entire industries based on the idea that if you want to have uh, an image on a web page, you have to pay the photographer who took the image, who owns the image. But if an image is online, anybody can link to it, embed it in their web page, and they've never actually copied it. All they've done is told your web browser where to go get it. And sure, you can complain if someone comes along with a web browser and looks at your image. You did put it on the web. Like, what's your problem? So that's even, even more troublesome. And then, of course, there's the far end of the case where you provide a link to an illegal copy of something. So... Might we accept that this is something that should be stopped? A link to an illegal copy of something would be part of the infringement. Would we, would we stretch that much? If I provide a link on my website to uh, a copy of a song that someone else has put online illegally, should I be caught up in the infringement proceedings? I didn't put the song online, I just have a link to it. I mean, some people would think yes, but at the same time, you have the difficulty, if I provide a link to something that's on the web and freely available on the web, how am I to know whether it's there legally or not? What if um, the copyright owner gave permission initially and then took it back? I mean, does the link I put when it was legitimate and then taken away? 
Does that link then become infringing? You have all these problems. Now, so one, one way we could address this is look at what the link is doing. So what's the function of the link? So you could look at like the economic impact of what's happening. Is it taking away advertising? Is it taking away resources unfairly? And that's, that's one approach. That hasn't really happened though. The courts haven't looked at what's going on and they've tried to find a way to um, just say links are good or bad. What's the case? It's like, um, like you know, sometimes on YouTube a video isn't available in your region. Yeah. And let's say another, and let's say another user mirrors the image. And yeah. It mirrors the, like the video of its own. Yeah. Is it still affected? Well, this goes back to the liability of YouTube and or the liability like, of intermediaries. Or if, like, in an article, if it's not available in your region and, and whoever's. If it's not available in your region, yeah, and then you, for whatever reason, yeah. and then someone makes it available in your region. Yeah, like he mirrors it yeah. or whatever. Actually, that's exactly where we end up. Okay. Um, so we, we come to that. So um, there was a case, Ticketmaster versus Tickets.com. Tickets.com had a website. These are all the cool events coming up. And then if you wanted to buy a ticket, it sent you straight to... Ticketmaster to buy the tickets. So you can say on Ticketmaster, you know, these are the concerts in Cork this month, um, blah, 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 blah. If you want to buy tickets, you can get them here. Ticketmaster was unhappy with that because I guess it wanted people to come through the front door of Ticketmaster and be exposed to what ads it might have. Um, but the court said that hyperlinking does not itself involve a violation of the Copyright Act since no copying is involved. So in the US, it's fairly clear, look, if you're not copying, you're not infringing copyright. But there was another case in Texas, I think, where someone was linking directly to streaming audio. So I think um, SFX, had a live had a had a live audio streaming thing, right? And this other competing website links directly to their stream. And there was no copying again, but the court said that SFX will likely suffer immediate and irreparable harm when the new racing season begins if Davis is not enjoined from posting links. So here, they did focus on the, the harm that could be caused, but it was, it was tricky. Interestingly, the judge drew the analogy between um, linking media to unauthorized retransmission of football games. So the idea that if you rebroadcast something that's broadcast, that's an infringement. But the question is, is that a good fit for hyperlinking. So there was a case in the UK of a website that allowed you to go onto the web and watch what was on the telly. I guess this was before the TV companies copped on to the fact that that's something my people might want to do. And the website was saying, but sure, we're only showing people, they, can, they were like, it's not now like, um, say, Sky Sports or something. This was free to air television anyway. And they were only showing you what you could see if you happened to have a television in your office and turned it on. So it was free to air now as opposed to, you know, paid subscription TV. But the Court of Justice of the EU said, no, that is communication to the public. And so you can't do that. So what was happening was um, ITV, uh, TV catch-up was, had, it, had, you know, kept getting the transmissions from the telly and then using the internet to send them on to people. There was a similar case then where a hotel was 
allowing the customers of the hotel in their hotel rooms to watch what was on the TV. And it had some setup where it was um, rebroadcasting the TV channels into people's hotel rooms. Whatever technical solution that was, probably wasn't terribly sophisticated at all. And the court found that that was communication to the public, irrespective of the fact that the public would have had access to that anyway. And also, I think the hotel tried to use the defense that's only like one person's room. That's not the public. So it wasn't clear before this whether communication to the public meant like rebroadcasting in the sense of like putting it on the web for the whole world to see. They're saying that even rebroadcasting television in the hotel was a communication to the public. And that was a kind of a, a surprising enough decision. There was a crowd in the US called Aereo that tried to do something similar to TV catch up. But the way they were getting around it was instead of having one aerial and streaming the channels to individual users, they gave each individual user their own aerial. And they're saying the people are just renting the aerial from us and we're retransmitting to their, bread, uh, their web browser what their aerial is set to. And they had like a room full of, you know, thousands of aerials. And this went all the way to the Supreme Court and, and they lost. Uh, but so they, they tried to get around it that way. And then the question then becomes, is television actually a good analogy for a hyperlink? And I think the, the answer is, is no. Um, if you look at what TV catch-up was doing, it's taking the broadcasts off the air and then it's transmitting those through their web servers across the internet to the individual people. But in a hyperlink, when you provide a hyperlink to someone, like if I say to you, you know, irishtimes.com, if once you click on that, it's nothing to do with me anymore. And the communication is just between the website and um, the reader's browser. And the person providing the link has no, has no hand act or, or part in that. So there were some cases then based on this. And again, it's all about the newspapers and, and their business model being, being tinkered with. So there was a search engine that indexed the news of the day and you, it provided you, you know, what's, what's happening and you could click and go to the individual sources. And this is a German case and the court found that that was not a communication to the public and did not infringe copyright. There was a Napster type case in Norway called Napster. There was a Napster.no. I don't know if it was the original Napster or a different one. But the Supreme Court of Norway held that posting hyperlinks was not making things available to the public. So the most important case then on this in Europe is the Svensson case. And this was a case of deep links where a news a website was linking directly to stories in a newspaper and the journalists sued. And the Swedish, the Swedish court asked the Court of Justice of the EU, did that constitute a communication to the public? And the court came back um, with a surprising answer, which we'll see in a second. There was a very similar case, the Bestwater case. And this was particularly cheeky, I thought. There was um, a company made a promotional video for its products. I think it was like water filters. And it was all about like how manky your water is and you really need a water filter. And a competitor of theirs embedded their YouTube video about, oh my God, your water's gross, on their website. And their argument was, well, this is a YouTube video online. If it's, you know, if it's a YouTube video, we can put it on our webpage. 
and all they were doing was providing a link to the YouTube video. It's not like they downloaded the YouTube video and copied it and put it on their website. They just, in their web page, provided a link to the YouTube video. And in the Svensson case, the Court of Justice decided that providing a link to a website does constitute an act of communication to the public. Which I think was just wrong. I, I think from a technical point of view, I, I, I don't see how you can justify that. But then I had this proviso, but it's not a new public. So it's okay. So providing a link to content online is a communication to the public, but it's okay provided it's a public that would have had access to it anyway. Which I think only makes things worse for me. Um, so that's, that's the position in law. So linking is legal. Um, even when a work appears in such a way as to give the impression that it is appearing on the site on which that link is found, whereas in fact it comes from another site. So that means embedding someone else's stuff in your web page, provided you don't copy it, is also legal. Which, you know, is a tricky one, but there you go. So you can do that. So you can put stuff online, incorporate it into your web page. And that's, that's okay. So linking is, and transclusion was the term they used, or we call that embedding. That's, that's legal also. If you think about it then, though that casts the television cases in a whole new light. I mean, if I'm making television broadcasts available to people who could have watched them anyway, Okay, I'll accept it's a communication to the public, but I could argue that it's not a new public. But if you're being very strict with your interpretation, well, no, because it wasn't available online before. So no, the, the, there's, there's a theoretical group of people who have internet connections, but not televisions. So they're a new public, perhaps. But it's certainly the, the logic that people like TV catch-up we're using, whereas we're only showing this to people who have legal access to it anyway. It seems to be consistent with, with that. Okay. Um, the courts also asked if Sweden could vary the law to require some sort of payment from the news aggregators. And the court said that, no, the internal market would be adversely affected by that. And the directive would be undermined. So there isn't much scope for national differences. Because this directive was um, put in place to try and harmonize the law across the EU. So there's some issues then that are come up as a result of this. So if I put a photograph online and I make it available on the web, Anybody now can incorporate that picture into their web page and I get diddly squat. I, I, I don't get to say, well, you're using my picture in your web page. If they just provide a link to the image I have online, then there's nothing I can do about that. People might decide that they require you to log in to their website to solve that problem. So if you require, for example, like if, if you have pictures on Flickr or someplace and you only allow people to see them if they're logged in, well, then that could be a way around that problem, for example. So we might see lots of single logins. No. So some interesting things have come. So that's the law then. But there's also um, some market forces at play. So German newspapers decided, they said to Google, you're ruining our business. All these links you're providing with Google News directly to um, our customer, you know, directly to people, the deep linking, we want you to pay us. And Google said, no, we're not paying. 
And so the newspaper said, right, you're not allowed link to our stuff anymore. And Google said, fine, so we're not going to have a big court case over it. We will stop linking to your news stories. We'll just shut down Google News for Germany. And they did that. And what do you think happened? No one saw their stuff. Traffic just dropped. Their ad revenue dropped. And so the newspapers in Germany came back to Google and said, OK, Google, we're sorry. You don't have to pay us. Like, please link to our stuff. In Spain, the government saw what happened in Germany. And so they made it that the newspapers couldn't opt in, that they had to be paid for their deep linking. And so Google News shut down in Spain and hasn't come back on. And now the newspapers are cross with the government for not allowing them to opt in to some sort of a scheme with Google. So basically, if you want Google to pay, if you want to charge Google for linking to your stuff, you might or might not have a perfectly good legal argument for that. But, you know, who wants to be invisible to Google? Who wants to say to Google, please ignore me? That's not going to work either. So if you go to um, news.google.ie, you'll see links to Irish news sites. If you go to Google, if you go to news.google.es, you'll see a note in Spanish saying, there is no more Google News. Um, this here, he, this man was the EU Commissioner for Digital Economy and Society. He stepped down recently. I think he's gone back to Germany to re-engage with German politics. Does anybody read German? What's the word? Abgabe? Abgabe? Well, it translates, you can translate it as a fee. So he seems to be saying when, he said when Google refers to um, and works with intellectual property from the EU, the EU can protect these values, or perhaps its value, maybe that's a poor translation, and ask Google to um, pay a fee, I suppose, not impose a fee. So this idea that Google should pay for linking to content, that seems to have um, some, some currency. But certainly the law is, is a tricky one there. I think what they did in the Fenson's case was a bit of a fudge. It's not terribly satisfactory. Okay, so we'll leave it there, so.